Good evening. Uh, th thank you, first of all, to the faithful few that are here at 10 p.m. for a panel. That's pretty cool. Uh, my name is Doug Fluger. I am uh, on a staff here at the convention. Um, the organizer of the convention, Dave, uh, knows that I'm an avid music fan. I came to town to do that. If any of you are from Middle Tennessee, you could probably throw a rock and hit a friend or waiter or waitress or uh, pedicab driver that came here to do the same thing. I came here to go to college, study music, music industry, and I'm now a, a, uh, in IT. I was a computer programmer, now I'm a, an analyst. Um, and when Dave pitched me the idea of doing this panel, uh, I, I don't know these guys at all. But one thing I, I have found that when I go to a concert, I go to a record store if I'm somewhere, and somebody starts bringing up old music and vinyl and really nerding out about it, uh, you can connect with anybody over that. So uh, this evening, we have Metal Jesus. Uh, Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. YouTube sensation. Uh, and Mike Vinacore. Uh, Stern employee, you want to tell them exactly what you do with a mic? Hello, everybody. Uh, so I, I spoke brief. I did, I did some research on uh, Metal Jesus, and uh, about a week ago, because Dave told me I was going to be doing this, I was like, well, I need to find out what the history of these dudes is. And I just met Mike today, but within, in the very brief time we talked, I learned a very important thing about Mike's uh, musical passion. And I believe he told me that he has 14,000 vinyl records. Yeah, over 14,000 now, but yeah. Wow. And the number went up because I went record shopping when I was in town yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and it will go up again tomorrow when I vanish from the show for a couple hours. W which which albums did you buy? Can you guys hear me through the – I can't hear myself, so. W which which albums did you buy while you're here? Uh, I don't even remember. I think I bought like about 20 records yesterday. Wow. Yeah. So I always come home and these things broke. Like, so Stern sends me on tour to all these different pinball shows. And one of the perks is, now Stern won't pay for this perk, sadly, is uh, I go record shopping in every city I go to, like on setup day, like when everybody's doing all the hard labor of putting our pinball machines together, I'm like going around and hitting up all the used record shops in town. So uh, I did that yesterday and I'll continue to do it tomorrow too. So I usually go home with a big tote bag that I got to carry on the plane. And that's why I have back problems and neck problems probably because... <laughs> I'm lugging around heavy records. Awesome. Well, um, you, as you guys know, there are a lot of different uh, tributaries of this particular conversation. So to start it off, I would probably ask what your origin story is in, in as much as what gave you like the music bug generally. And then we'll get into the acquisition of physical media. You want to go first? I had a really hot babysitter. And uh, it's a true story. And uh, she liked Journey. And I was like, wow, she's hot. She likes Journey, so I'll like Journey. <laughs> that was like the fourth grade or something. But my dad was really big into music. I remember he, uh, he had a record collection. He put headphones you know, on my, in my head when I was really young. A uh, couple albums I was really obsessed with as a kid was uh, the Grease soundtrack. You know, the Living Newton John and all that stuff. I still love that soundtrack today. Um, but also, you know, I'm an, I'm an 80s kid, so I love 80s pop. And so Journey and just listening to Casey Kasem's Top 40 Countdown, I was the kid who had a cassette and I would try to wait till the very last moment when he stopped talking to get that Def Leppard, you know, Pyromania song on my cassette so I could listen to it over and over. And uh, I've, always, I've always had the music bug for sure. You know, I've always been really passionate about it. I do video games for YouTube primarily, but as my wife can contest, I listen to music all the time. When people come over to our house, there is always music playing, you know, and, and I, it's a way of kind of playing DJ and stuff like that. So, but uh, yeah, I've had, it, had the bug for a while, for sure. Uh, so my story is a little longer because my origins with music and, and my career are very, they're weaved together. So um, when I was about six years old, my first me my first memories of playing games and my first memories of music are both tied to my dad. My dad had Beatles records and in our living room we had this old console stereo from the 60s. Um, I'm old so like I was born in 1969 so I grew up in the 70s. So my dad used to play me his Beatles albums in the living room and I was complete that was my first memory of hearing music and my first memory of seeing vinyl records. 
And I became obsessed with him like immediately. So much so that at age six, he taught me how to use the stereo myself because he was too lazy to keep getting up and putting on records for me. So he's like, look, I'll just show you how to do it. And I didn't know how to take care of records. But when I was a little bit older, like maybe eight, my dad, my parents would give me like a dollar a week for allowance. And I didn't really do anything around the house, you know, so I don't know why I got the dollar. But I'd go to Kmart and buy a 45 of some song I liked on the radio every week. So I had built up this little record collection, like before I even hit 10 years old. None of those records really survived my childhood because I didn't know how to take care of them. Um, back up to the same age, as soon as I could reach the flipper buttons on a pinball machine, my dad ex took me to the arcade that was at the end of our block. And I got obsessed with pinball. And then when video games started coming in, I got obsessed with that. Later, my cousin worked at that same arcade, and I lived there. And then later on, I worked at that arcade, and that led indirectly to my career in video games and pinball. So um, I was so consumed with records. When I got into junior high school, I was in seventh grade, uh, these kids, older kids in eighth grade turned me into punk rock, and that completely changed my life. And I wouldn't be sitting on the stage if it wasn't for, my, for punk rock changing my life because that led to my career in the game industry. But um, then I just went hardcore, like, record collector, and I knew how to take care of them then. So I still have all, many of those records I had as a teenager, and, uh, and I've been collecting nonstop ever since. So it's been 40 years of hardcore, obsessive record collecting, but really, you know... 45 years or so of buying records of listening to music. And I also do concert photography part-time. I published a punk rock fanzine from 1985 to 1998. And I do a website where, you, where I do review concerts and photograph them and like review records. So it's been the one constant in my life since I was a little kid. And meeting somebody at a punk rock show led to my career in the game industry. It was a path I didn't even have planned. Like, I happened into it because I met somebody at a concert. Wow. Um, so, uh, Journey, punk rock, uh, I have some, there are milestones in your life with certain things with your passions. Um, I can remember the first record I got and then the first record I bought with my own money. I pitched that to you, Metal Jesus. Man, it's it's so it, it it's gonna seem so lame because we're supposed to be talking about metal, but I'm gonna I'm a kid in the '80s, man. So do you remember that song? It was like the greatest American hero. Believe it or not, um, I, I used to love that TV show. I know, I know. So I think that was one of the first records I ever bought. I still have it. Like I'm talking to 45, right? Uh, my parents were so annoyed because I played it all the time, you know. But, uh, but I like a good melody in songs. And so even when it comes to metal, like I tend to listen to stuff that has a little bit more a melody to it. You know what I mean? Because I, I have that sort of uh, you know, DNA or whatever. But that, was, that, that one, and also you mentioned video games. Uh, what was it? Buckman? It was Pac-Man Fever. Oh, Buckner and Garcia. Yeah, remember Pac-Man yeah. Fever? I have that record. So yeah, yeah, I know. I do too. It's so funny. Again, like kind of cheesy sort of stuff, you know. I, uh, I met one of those guys at one of these shows. Oh, did you? Yeah, the one of them passed away, but the surviving guy was doing like was at one of the shows I was at. It's a super catchy song, and they did a bunch of them. They did like Do the Donkey Kong. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. It's they so had a weird. whole album, and they're all video game gimmick songs. I know. It's songs, so yeah. hilarious, but. Uh, I think that's a, it was 45s for sure. Um, and then I think, like, the I remember buying, as far as an album goes, I remember hearing in, in junior high a guy, like a stoner dude, had a Kiss album. And I lived in a really small town at the time of, like, 3,000 people. It was Coopville, Washington. It's, like, really small. And the stoner dude would meet me down this 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 scary road and sell me this like kisses rock and roll over and i was and i i'd saved up like five dollars to go buy it from this dude hoping he wasn't going to beat me up he's probably the nicest guy ever but you know what i mean when you're young and uh i remember getting kisses rock and roll over back home i had to hide it from my parents because they're very religious and kiss was knights in satan's service <laughs> and uh i remember it had a big old scratch on the back side and I was like so bummed but there was no other record store in our town so I had to just suck it up and play side A of Kiss's you know album so didn't the department store sell records in there no 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 uh in our town in Coopville Washington it was uh there was a like a 7-Eleven and it was for truckers and so they had like this little spindle thing would have cassettes on it right that, so I could that, play them in the trucks yeah 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 and so <laughs> there was no I think we had a Safeway, 
and that was pretty much it. So there was no record store. So yeah, you would you the the dark alleys of uh, you know <laughs> of junior high, to, to, you know some dude. So, but uh, you know I, I loved it, man. It, it sent me on my my journey for Kiss and then rock and metal and that sort of stuff. Don't feel bad about your first record. The uh, first record I remember specifically telling my mom to go buy me was the Sesame Street Fever record, which was a a, a mash, you know, kind of a Saturday Night Fever. The year was 1978. So. I think I have that record too. Actually, I think you probably have. Oh, every do record. you? I'm, yeah, I, yeah. I'm total, that's a total yeah, shoot. Yeah, I have for that everything. Record. You have that record. Yeah, 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 Mad yeah. props. If not, you're gonna go buy it tomorrow. Yeah, probably, <laughs> if, if the price is right. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about you, Mike? So my origin story is a little longer, and my, I mean, not my origin story, my memory, like I have key ones, so I'll just share with you the key ones. The first two records I remember seeing were those Beatles records of my dad's, which was A Hard Day's Night, the version with the red cover, and then, um, and he had Magical Mystery Tour. And then I don't remember the first record I bought myself with my own money, but I could tell you, like, a couple of pivotal bands that I used to collect records from. Um, one of them was Kiss, as you mentioned. Like, they were superheroes to me in the 70s. Yeah. Like, I remember, like, being so excited to watch the Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park Shout on TV. Shout out to the Kiss shirt right there. Yeah, that's an awesome Hell shirt. Hell yeah. So, yeah, man, like, let's see it. Let's see it. Yeah, yeah. Display it. Gun. Love yeah. Gun. Yep. Love Gun. Yep. Like, like, I distinctly remember having, like, uh, Kiss Alive, and I think I had Love Gun and Rock and Roll Over, and I had uh, Peter Chris's solo album, I think Ace's solo album. And uh, and then I and then I got into really into Cheap Trick. They were like my favorite band for a couple of years. So I had like everything that they had done at that point, which was like four or five albums. And then I got really obsessed with ACDC in the sixth grade, which was like a precursor to me discovering punk rock without me knowing it, you know. But that was like the hardest stuff I was listening to. And ACDC had the distinction of turning me into like a different kind of record collector, and that was one that collects variations of things. So like if I'll buy the same record a hundred times if it's, there's something's different about it. It's on a different color of vinyl. It came from a different country. They changed the color on the cover to something different. I have to have them. Like, it, only if I'm really obsessed with the band, but sadly, that's a lot of bands. So you have the Bob Ludwig pressing of Led Zeppelin II? I'm I assuming. am missing that one. Like, oh, yeah. And I'm not paying a lot of money for that, but I will tell you, every copy I find used, I open that thing up to look, and someday I'm going to find one, damn it. Um, but... I was at this record store down the street from my house, coincidentally right next door to that arcade I just told you guys all about. They had these Australian pressings of like a first few ACDC albums. It was like Dirty Deeds, Let There Be Rock. There was an album called TNT, which never came out in the States. And then there was one more. Um, and they had different covers, and some of them had a couple different tracks. So I'm like, oh, I need these too. It's like I couldn't sleep at night not having these things. And that's what turned me into like somebody that collected different versions of records. And now it's just completely out of control where like there's some records I've got like 30 copies of it because they're all different colors of vinyl. And I don't do that with every band. And a lot of that, some of those things that I've got 30 copies of, I got most of them for free because I have friends that do these record labels. But... I will buy, like, any Cure record I don't have. I don't care what, you know, if I've got 10 of them. If it's from a different country or it's a different pressing, I have to have it. Same with The Damned. Same with Husker Du. There's a lot of stuff I will collect everything of. My favorite band is Skinny Puppy, and I have to have... I'm one record short of having every record they ever did in any country. Like, so I've got, you know, every... this The European one, the Canadian one, the U.S. one. Like, so it's... Yeah. Yeah, one. I can't sleep at night because of one stupid record that that was pressed in Australia, and I can't find the damn thing. So those, and then my, fr but I can also tell you my first two punk rock records just were. Let's um, have it. Uh, Sex Pistols, Great Rock and Roll Swindle, because I actually found that before Bollocks, and then I, 999, uh, their their album called Concrete. Those are my first two. Never mind the Bollocks was my third punk record, and then my first two hardcore punk seven inches were Black Flag Six Pack and JFA's Blatant Localism, and those were all that stuff were complete life changers for me, and then set me down. That changed the whole course of my life to ex why I'm sitting here and why anything that ever happened to me did was because of getting into punk rock and the in middle school, you know, or junior high. Okay, I have to comment on both of your um, both of your answers. Uh, Metal Jesus, did your copy of Rock and Roll Over have the sticker inside of it? No. Did it have the it order? Didn't even have a sleeve. That's, that's oh, how it was it's just the yeah. just the raw yeah, record in the sleeve. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Mike, favorite Black Flag uh, vocalist? Uh, Ron Reyes, aka Chavo. Oh, you're yeah. and you're an OG. Okay. Good. Um, Henry would be number two. <laughs> I saw the 
2014 version of Black Flag. I don't consider that Black Flag. And worse than that, I saw the really crappy <laughs> me, the cat uh, benefit reunion show. I flew to L.A. for that thing, and it was so bad. It was fun for the fact that a, I had a lot of friends from all over the U.S. flew in for this thing. It was like a really big deal. And it was like the worst show I ever saw. But it was fun because I got super drunk with a bunch of my friends. This is back when I drank. And uh, so it was a good time. But, man, that was a waste of like $30 or whatever they were charging for a ticket. Right. And then, and then the version that you saw, like, I don't even acknowledge that as anything Black Flag. It was like a skater was the singer. Yeah, Mike Vallely. Yeah. yeah. He's a great skater, but I don't really think of him as a Black Flag vocalist. All right. I'll talk to you later about my experience, but not while it's being recorded. <laughs> um, so uh, Kiss uh, had a huge impact on me. It wasn't the first music that, you know, moved me. It was probably something like ELO. Or something. Uh, ELO is a fantastic. Yeah, aren't they? Aren't they e great? I love ELO. My dad was was uh, in the Navy in Vietnam, and uh, they were frequently going through the Philippines. So he would take his money and buy, you know, real expensive cameras and stuff like that. And at one point, he bought a, a late '60s Sansui stereo system. I still have those speakers. You could literally survive a, a, an atomic bomb if you sat behind them. Um, and uh, so all through the 70s growing up, I would have his uh, headphones and I would just listen to whatever was on FM radio. And I'm from a college town. So we had, it wasn't just like Top 40, it was Frank Zappa, and all, all this, you know, Jethro Tull and all this kind of stuff. But ELO was just like, the production on it was so crazy. I would just, you know, I'd stand on the couch and make instruments out of Tinker Toys and pretend that I was playing and stuff. Um, anyway, but when I discovered Kiss, and I was way late in the game. Um, it was the Kiss Meets the Phantom show, which was patently horrible. But also awesome. But also yeah, awesome I mean, for the when same. I was in, are, when are I was in grade school, with, I thought it was awesome. Are you familiar <laughs> with, with what he's talking about? So Kiss got together with Hanna-Barbera to do a television show. It was a and movie, it, a TV movie. Yeah, it was a TV movie called uh, Kiss Meets... It was, it was called something else. Kiss like, Meets Kiss? the Phantom of the Park. Yes. Yeah, yeah, in the U.S., and it's just as horrible as you might imagine. Like, um, first of all, if you're a Kiss fan, Kiss doesn't really show up for 45 minutes of the movie. Like, it's it's all about the stupid uh, evil like, genius yeah, building yeah, these yeah. robots that's going to try to take over the world. It's so dumb. Um, and, and, like, this, this lady's boyfriend gets kidnapped, turned into a robot. And then finally, Kiss shows up and saves the day. So, you know, there's that. And, but, and then didn't Ace just only squawk? Like, he didn't actually speak yeah, any words? Yeah, and Peter Chris's voice was, he was so drunk that they had to dub it with the guy who does Shaggy from uh, Scooby-Doo. Right, Ro Gene, I'm going to yeah, beat the drums. It's, it's the weirdest thing to, to see. And yeah, Ace just goes, ah! The yeah, whole time. yeah, but yeah, when, yeah, but when you're a kid in grade school and Kiss are superheroes to you, that thing was fantastic. Well, it just didn't uh, you, age you, you well when you're that. an adult. <laughs> you say that. However, my wife, uh, we would bond over this because Rebecca, there, yeah. you know, she she was a huge Kiss fan uh, until she saw that show. Like you loved Ace Freely. I did until you heard his voice. Well, well I was 13, and <laughs> I absolutely had a huge crush on Ace Freely. And I never really, I was too young to, to go to concerts, so I never heard him really speak before yeah. until the movie. And I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's so bad. It's it's such a bad. I love the show because it's so bad. It's very quotable, but um, it's, like, it's it's like Showgirls. It's so bad. It's good. It is like 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 for instance, like they couldn't get Ace and Peter to do the action sequences, and so they got stunt doubles that are really obvious that they're like not them at all, like doing cartwheels and stuff it's oh my god it's it, awesome. it didn't age well but their to, music has though let's put it this way we used to have parties at my house and one night i would i would put on a bad movie i, I love bad movies like star crash and all these kind of movies uh beyond the valley of the dolls all these kind of really bad movies kind of all run we put on kiss meets the fan in the park and you know how at the end of the party everyone's tired they're putting on their jacket you know they're getting ready to leave and everyone's kind of standing around going what the hell is this movie you know and then slowly, the jackets come off. It's like 2 in the morning. People are kind of hanging out. And soon, our entire living room was filled with people. It turned into like a Rift tracks like moment. It was amazing. It was one of the best parties ever that we had. Everyone stayed until the bitter end to see what the hell this movie was. It was awesome. Yeah. Do you know what was so great about it is that, and this is part of... Um, 
I'm going to sound like an old guy, but uh, these kids these days don't know what it was like. The, the only way like to see your favorite music people yeah. moving or to hear their actual talking voice was so rare. Mm -hmm. um, you'd had to like, there was a lot of times an order form or an address on the, on the, on the sleeve about how to join the fan club. The um, Kiss Army. Yeah, the Kiss, the Kiss Army. Army for one. Um, and then if like they came to your town and the local news crew went there and they filmed part of the concert, you just, uh, you know, I, we, I certainly didn't have a VCR in the seventies. Uh, we were quite a ways out from VCR at that point, but, um, any snippet you could get of anything like, uh, you know what my, like one of my uh, virtually an ASMR video for me is Wolfman Jack, <laughs> because I used to, my parents were like, were, let me stay up late on the weekends and Wolfman Jack. And I, it, I just love the sound of Wolfman Jack's voice, but that and Don Kirshner's rock concerts, they had stuff on there you couldn't see anywhere else. Um, uh, what's his name? Paul. Paul Lynn's Halloween special, was it? Oh, yeah, yeah. That stuff. We, we had a, when I was in grade school, like, we were the first people I knew that had a VCR. My dad somehow got one for free through, like, a, a family business. And uh, I wouldn't, he wouldn't let me stay up to watch Saturday Night Live, but he would record it for me. And I really liked it for two things. Like, I wanted to see the Mr. Bill, you know. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I was in grade school, right? But I also liked to see the musical acts, yeah. so. There were some really great ones on there. And then there was a show called Fridays, which was – do you remember that one? Yes. It had, Larry they, David they, was on there. Yeah, but they would show some videos too. I'm, that's where I first heard Dream Police from Cheap Trick because oh, they played a music video for it. And it looked like a live video. And I, I was a kid. I didn't know any better, so I thought it was like a live video. But it was just a music video. But that was a good place to check out music yeah. too. In regard to Kiss, do you know why Fridays is particularly special? I don't recall. We didn't get that where I, I grew up. Oh, really? It was yeah. on network TV. Yeah, like Michael Richards was on it. Yeah, uh, Larry it was David. on like NBC or, or ABC. I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. But uh, the the one of the the only thing that I there were some of the skits I remember. I was still you know I was like ten or so, but they had Kiss on there to perform songs from The Elder. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a deep cut. You got to be a real Kiss fan to listen to The Elder. Yeah, and if you are, you probably still don't yeah, want to sit the through it. Elder <laughs> was, the Elder was Kiss's attempt to do a version of like Tommy the uh, or uh, the you know the Who's Tommy versus like uh, well they got the producer from uh, Pink Floyd's. Wasn't like Bob Ezrin. Well, yes, yeah, Bob, Bob Ezrin. Ezrin. He did was Destroyer it? too. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Destroyer is my favorite Kiss but album. It was like their ver It was like a prog version of like it was horrible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that, coincidentally, that's when they cut off all their hair in two. So yeah, like, that's true. So yeah. it was shocking on two fronts. They looked a lot different, yeah. and the record was It's a bad time. Bad like time. Not yeah. kiss. Um, I don't know. Do you think Unmasked is better than The Elder? So I, yes. we can nerd out on, yeah. on Kiss here big big time. Someone's so. chuckling out there, so everyone knows what yeah, I'm talking this about. This has somehow become a whole panel about Kiss, but I'm okay with it. I, I can nerd out on <laughs> yeah. Kiss. So so actually, I, I've learned to really like the Unmasked, or Un Unmasked album. Yeah. Um, it, it, is it better than The Elder? I think so, personally. Okay. I, I think there's better songs on it. I uh, totally I, agree. I, yeah. I, I, now I can listen to that whole album from beginning to end and actually enjoy it. Um, <clears throat> There's even today. There's only a few songs on the Elder that I actually really like. You know, uh, "Escape from the Islands" one of them because it's instrumental. It's it's, it's Ace Freely. It's a little rocking tune, but there's some bad lyrics on that on the Elder Man. It's bad. Oh yeah. I, I look at Elder very much like I look at Bad Religion's second album called "Into the Unknown." It's a it was an unplanned comedy album that you put on for your friends to make oh. them to like blow their minds or like that can't be the same band, right? Yeah. True. I don't know if you've ever heard the second Bad Religion album, but it's this really bad prog rock album, and prog uh, rock, and, and which is why which is why it was out of print for like forty something years, hmm. or forty years roughly. Let me guess, Ryko disc re-released. No, it. no. So they you know, they pressed it once, and you know everybody like you know slammed it, and rightfully so, it was terrible. And then it was out of print for like forty years. And when they did that Bad Religion box set, maybe it was thirty years. They put it in there, which I was shocked. I figured there's no way they're putting it, and but they didn't release it individually so the only place you can either get it is if you bought that box set which is now long out of print or you have like me you have the original or you're like me you have both so how many copies of the original pressing of that record do you have Mike? just one because oh, there okay. was only one pressing of it there was no, and i'm not a bad religion completist so i don't need to have it all like you know i draw the i have to draw the line somewhere or i'd be homeless with just me and my <laughs> records you know <laughs> right right 
Okay, I'll, I'll peel off from Kiss, although I could talk for three hours about Kiss. Um, so Kiss, for me, was a gateway drug, right? When did you start getting into the, the heavier stuff, Metal Jesus? So, again, I'm, I'm a kid fr from the 80s, and so I remember, you know, hair metal being on the radio. So actually... Um, well, Rock and Roll Over was one of the first Kiss albums I owned, but really it was like Kiss's Asylum and the fact that they would play Tears Are Falling on MTV every afternoon on their top 10 countdown or whatever it was. So, so I was really big into, you know, the animalized era of Kiss, uh, Asylum, that sort of stuff. And, you know, I got into Dokken. My cousin really got me interested in, um, you know, Van Halen, um, ACDC, you know, back in black, that sort of stuff. But it was the hair metal stuff for sure for me. The, you know, it was just that era. It was all over the radio. It was all over MTV. And I, I soaked it up. I bought every album. Um, and, I, and I went deep on it too. Like, you know, the, the, the weird bands that only had one hit song, stuff like that. Wait, can, yeah. Can I, uh, I, have a, I have a confession. I don't acknowledge any non-makeup kiss as kiss. But, You're and wrong. I'll tell you what, and I'll, and I don't hope I don't get fired for saying this, because, <laughs> but um, um, I'm mad that we have non-makeup Kiss songs on our Kiss pinball machine that we did at Stir. <laughs> like, I support so, you in your anger. You know, so, like, I mean, I'm like, really? Do we have to have those in there? You know, it, it's interesting because I listen to a Kiss podcast, uh, Three Sides to the Coin, and and. They're a little bit older than I am on there, and they, they have the same arguments too. Where you know the, the great thing about Kiss is they've lasted so long and changed with the times that it really depends on when you come in and, and meet in in kind of you know embrace them that they've got a little of everything. You yeah, know I mean? mean I get why they did it, and it was a smart business move, and like I would respect it, right? They were floundering, and then the whole music scene yeah. changed, and then they took off the makeup, changed their sound a little bit, and then fit right in and sold a ton of records again. So they did what they needed to do. It's like a wrestler well, changing his gimmick, you know. I, we're going back to Kiss. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, briefly, we twist my arm. Yeah. But, but I would argue though that Paul Stanley is a very good songwriter because, like for instance, the the infamous song "I Was Made for Loving You," you know, during the the disco era, he's like, "Oh, I can do that," and he went off, wrote "I Was Made for Loving You," and he did that, and he, you know, bought them houses and cars. I mean, and the same thing with like. Uh, the hair metal type is it, you know, he, they saw all these bands like Bon Jovi or whoever coming up and they're like, I, we can do that. And that they did that, you know, and they did it pretty successfully, I think. Yeah. So. I never got big into the hair metal because they weren't, that wasn't hard enough for me, but I will say I have a, very, I have a soft spot for it. And like, it was my sister and I watched MTV like crazy when we were home, even though I didn't like most of what they played, it was still entertaining. So I know all that stuff. And now like, if I see those records, I'll pick them up used, you know, because I just have a fond memories of hanging around my sister in our living in our family room watching MTV. The the one weird one that that Kiss did, I think, is really bizarre, but I still like it too. Is when they did grunge. So again, in the mid '90s, they were like, "Oh, Alice in Chains, we can do that," and they did Carnival Souls. Carnival of Souls. Yeah, which I, I again, I'm from Seattle, so I'm like, "Oh, they actually did a pretty decent version of Alice in Chains style music." Bruce Kulick, I, in fact, the kid guy I grew up with from 1978 on, we were both into Kiss, and uh, he sent me a video last night of Bruce Kulick playing some Carnival of Souls I songs on the that. Kiss Cruise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah my, the metal I got into in the mid the mid 80s like was like thrash metal, you know, like and the gateway for me was hardcore punk, like a lot of those bands. So in the middle of the 80s, like punk rock, like the bands either went like more pop. And they were like, or like college rock, we called it, or they went metal. So like a band like DRI, for example, and Dr. No, all these bands that became known as crossover music, right? Where the hardcore bands started playing metal because they learned how, they got bored and they learned how to play their instruments better. And they wanted to like, you know, kind of dabble in that. A lot of the diehard hardcore punks hated it. I loved it. And then that was my gateway into learning like about Metallica and Slayer yeah. and Megadeth and Anthrax. Exodus. And I, yeah, I ate all that stuff up like candy. That was exciting to me as the... Hard, early hardcore was, was, you know, was the thrash metal. So I was all about that stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I, I did like an old souls tour of music because it went from Kiss. My parents, you know, I had Jimi Hendrix smash hits and their records, Carol King Tapestry. I was never going to touch that, right? But um, I then went into, I think, uh, Rush mm. was my, my next band. And, yeah. You know, and then, we just did a Rush pinball machine at the beginning of this year. I know, and I see you've got some different uh, back glasses on these, too. Um, and then kind of got into uh, British Invasion type stuff, like, uh, 
Well, is Deep Purple considered British Invasion? Yeah. I don't know. I'll, I'll give it to yeah, you. Yeah. Sure. Oh, thanks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I got into, into uh, Deep Purple and then, like you, early 80s hair metal and then mid 80s and late 80s hair metal. And um, I can't really think of a record. My first concert was Dokken, Back for the Attack oh, nice. tour. Yeah. Um, I started playing guitar during that time. So all my, the music I was listening to was very, um, very guitar centric. Mm -hmm. And then I think probably when I started feeling like, man, I'm getting really edgy. Was I got uh, I discovered the I, the um, Among the Living record by Anthrax, which to me is their tentpole record. Oh, absolutely! I saw them on that tour, by the way. Ah, I'm so jealous. Um, that Megadeth's Peace Cells record was huge for me. Uh, I have some heretical thinking about Metallica. Uh, my my favorite Metallica record is And Justice for All. I'm sorry. I, I dig that album a lot too. I mean, I play, Blackened is a great song. I played it to death. I know that people love um, Master of Puppets. I'm it's not that it's bad. I just haven't listened to it a lot. Um, I Ride the Lightning and all of that. I think the first record I was into. Um, but, uh, you know, and then, and then like Pantera, you know, the. Uh, uh, Vulgar Display. Vulgar Display Plow. Yeah. I saw that yeah. tour. And, um, and uh, from Hell, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I remember the night I was actually at, uh, don't hold this against me, Mike. I was at the. Concert for Kiss's Revenge Tour, Municipal Auditorium downtown. Great album, by the way. It is a great album. Yeah. Um, we're back to Kiss. Uh, some of the best songs were written by Middle yeah. Tennessee resident Vinnie Vincent, actually. Right. Um, but uh, I'm, we're walking through the, the thing up top there, going to our seat, and there's this guy handing out flyers, and he hands us a little flyer for um, – Pantera. My roommate and I had discovered Pantera months previous, and we're just floored by that record. I don't know if you know. To have been alive then, for Pantera to come out was just astounding. I saw, I saw Pantera twice. Once they headlined and Neurosis opened, and once I saw Pantera open for the original Black Sabbath when they did that first that original oh, reunion. Oh, that would have the been The first cool. time Black Sabbath ever united with all four members. And we saw Pantera at Ozfest, didn't we? With Judas Priest and yeah, I remember they played. I didn't, yeah, I didn't go, really but cool they, I remember they were on one, at least one Ozfest. Yeah, it was at my favorite venue that has now been destroyed and replaced with a hotel called Three Twenty Eight Performance Hall, and um, it was a sold out show. Like we had to go like to Kastner Knot, which is a department store, and go to the ticket thing on a Saturday morning and get our ticket. And um, I remember showing up and. This was like my first experience with like a really extreme crowd because they, uh, it was just like a, the bathroom was a biohazard. It was just like a brick building, right? But everybody and their mom played there. The Pumpkins played there on their Gish tour. Foo Fighters played there the first record. It was, it was a very memorable place. Um, but I remember the floor having this uh, fake floor. And then I think the fake floor was attached to a barrier that protected you, that kept you from going over the stage. Like, you couldn't move that barrier. And there were some, uh, allegedly, skinhead dudes that were slamming up against it, trying to get through it. And the lights dimmed, and the, the uh, show starts. And uh, I didn't mean to take over this conversation. I, I'm, I'm very enwrapped with this particular concert. And the lights go down, and this band I'd never heard of uh, called White Zombie started playing. And I was just like, what is this, man? It was the Lost Sex Resisto record, which is an awesome record if you've never heard it. And uh, to have that and then have Vulgar Display Tour, I got five dime bag picks that night. It was just an amazing night. Anyway. Uh, uh, wait, I, I, you, I have a White Zombie story. So uh, I saw a White <laughs> Zombie. Nobody knew who they were yet. It was in 1988. They opened for uh, The Undead and Toxic Reasons. And um, they were this really bad, sludgy rock band. And everybody sat on the floor. It was up to a place called Club Dreamers in Chicago. Everybody during White Zombie that they played first sat on the floor with their backs to the stage because they thought they were so bad. And they played three songs, uh, three or four songs, and got pissed off. And they threw their instruments against the wall and walked off the stage because nobody liked them. And I thought they were terrible. At the time, they were one of the worst bands I ever saw. And then 
I got, I got a promo of their God of Thunder 12 inch. It was like they did a kiss cover. Again, everything leads to kiss, I guess. Um, and I thought, wow, this is a lot better than that <laughs> that I saw. Can I swear at this? I'm sorry if I wasn't supposed Too to. Late. Um, Can't uh, take they, that back. Yeah, this crap that I saw. I'm like, man, they, they sound a lot better, but I still don't like them. And then a few years later, they became huge. And I'm just like, yeah. what happened? Like, how do they trick so many people? But musically, they got way better, you know. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, how do they trick so many people into liking them? And now they're this huge band. Yeah. So uh, we, we've turned into, we've got taken the conversation to live music. What was your first concert, Metal Jesus? Um, oh, God. all my answers are so lame. Um, well, wait, wait, wait till you steps. get to mine. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, my parents took me in Roseburg, Oregon. I think it was to B.J. Thomas, <laughs> who did "Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head." That dude. Yeah, I was in the pit. No. Um, <laughs> That was, that, that was, I think that was technically the first one, although the, the, the first show that I really, really, I want to say it was probably uh, that I actually like bought a ticket for myself, and, and it, I, I believe it was like a junior high or high school, um, was uh, Motley Crue's um, Dr. Feelgood tour. So they played in, in, in Seattle, you know, it, that record was huge, Dr. Feelgood was all over the radio, and it, it was also at the time when Tommy Lee was doing his thing with the drum set where he would fly over the audience and uh, do a drum solo, you know? So it was, it was, it was pretty awesome. It was, I had a great time. And also too, I think I lost some of my hearing on that show or it was so loud. Oh no. Yeah. But it was awesome though. Have you changed your way since then? Hearing wise? Uh, no. I mean, I'm, a, I'm older now, so I'm wiser. So I do have a little bit of tinnitus in my ears if I'm being honest with you. So, but that's because I used to go to a ton of shows you know, for for a while when I was working at a record store in Seattle, um, the the local promoter would give us tickets to every show that came through. And this was in the 90s with grunge. So I did go to a ton of shows. And actually, the loudest show I ever went to was a band called Stereo Lab, surprisingly. Not metal, but they were so freaking loud that it, 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 blew my, it blew my ears out. And so the next day I woke up and my ears have been ringing ever since. <laughs> I, I have hearing damage from a ministry show in 1989. Yeah. And I wasn't even up close. I was way up in the balcony. It was that loud. At the time, that was yeah. a loudest show for decades. That got beaten by the Swans, by the way, who are the loudest band probably on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. But that was the last show, that ministry one, that I wore, that I did went to when I didn't wear earplugs. And I wear earplugs yeah. ever since. And as a conference, concert photographer, I'd be totally deaf right now if yeah. I wasn't wearing them. Yeah, I mean – that's a that would definitely be the first thing I would tell anybody younger going to shows is that or even just like you know it, it, clubs is that it's not worth it you know what I mean thankfully my tinnitus does not drive me crazy but I can I can tell I could see where it could you know what I mean there, there's some people out there who it, it really damages their ears so thankfully I don't have to deal with that um, we were just talking about this though that we have the earbuds from Apple and even in normal mode it lowers the volume just by wearing them and it's it's a feature of so anyways it's really really nice if you want to just go like if you want to go down to downtown nashville just put them in your ears and everything is is quieter it's actually really nice so oh, interesting feature yeah so my first concert um <clears throat> my mom was like this pop artist named rex smith most he didn't he was like a one-hit wonder i think have you ever heard of him Sounds familiar. uh solid gold probably is yeah he, he was used on to there be all over TV, yeah. 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 So she had his album, and there was this amusement park that was in a shopping mall in Bolingbrook, Illinois, which was, you know, 15 minutes south of our house, um, called Old Chicago. It, the place was awesome. I used to like to go there for the rides. So my parents took me there because my mom wanted to see the Rex Smith concert, and that was my first concert. And I was miserable because I didn't like his music. It was really loud. Like, I ate some bad food, and I kept having to run to the bathroom, like, every 10 minutes. It was, and then eventually I got to go on the on the rides, which is why I wanted to go there. But I used to beg my dad, like, take me to see Kiss. Take me. He would. He's like, if you can win tickets on the radio, I'll take you. And I tried, like, hell, every night, to, and I never won. So my first concert that I went to by myself, that was what I consider my, my first concert, was a punk rock show. And if you, any of you guys punk rock fans, have you ever heard of a band called The Faction? They were like a skate punk band from San Jose. Steve Caballero, the pro skater, was in that band. Anyway, um, they were a huge band if you were a teenage punk rock kid in the 80s, and you were a skateboarder like I was. Um, they played in my friend Keith Lyons' garage. He had a detached garage in Downers Grove, like 
like four blocks from me. I just rode my skateboard there. And he put on this huge punk rock show. It was headlined by the faction because they were on tour that summer. That was my first show. And uh, coincidentally, like 20 years later, I became friends with the singer. And I went to their very last show. And I put out a record on my record label of them that we sold for a benefit for a children's hospital at their farewell gig. Very cool. Very cool. Um, what year was that? The, the, oh, it's 1985. 85? Yeah. It was what like year July. was the Rex Smith concert? It was in the 70s, like late 70s, I think. Oh, wow. I don't even remember. That that old Chicago place only lasted for a couple of years. Here's what sucks. Like, I didn't know this at the time, I, but the Ramones played there. And I'm like, why didn't my mom get into the Ramones and take me to old Chicago to see that? Then I would have got into punk rock even sooner. Yeah. You, but, know, it, you know, these older kids, like, they had to turn me on to that, you know, years later. But I'm like, I could have seen the Ramones if my mom was cooler. Did you see all the old punk bands when they were in their prime? Like, Some. Did you see Minor Threat? No, no. Because, you know, I got into punk rock in 1982. And so a lot, and I didn't, I was like 13 or 12. So I didn't have a car, and I didn't know how to get to the city via train or have the money to do any of that, right? And I didn't really feel like, I was friends with those older kids that turned me into punk rock, but not enough where I even thought, like, hey, I could ask them to drive me to the show. So I didn't get to start going to shows until I was 15, so I missed a lot of that stuff, um, sadly. you know. So I, I remember, like, you know, JFA playing at, like, Tuts and all these things. I'm like, I have no way to get there. I had tickets to a Dead Kennedy show with one of my best friends. We bought these tickets not knowing how we are going to get there. We're like, we'll figure it out. We never figured it out. It was, like, the Granada Theater or someplace like that. I don't remember the name, but it had some weird name. Yeah, we never got to go. Did you ever catch the replacements? Only when they reunited. I wasn't. I was a big Husker Du guy, and I wasn't a replacements guy. I, but even though, like, I liked a few of their songs, like, I just never cared enough to go. But they, when they reunited, they played Riot Fest. I shot them at the Riot Fest. You know. Oh. Uh, are you a replacements fan? Yeah, p- punk is something I never really got into, other than you know, which you would probably consider very pop. I mean, no effects, that sort of stuff, like skate punk type stuff, you know. But. Uh, um, bad religion for sure, but nothing, nothing too deep. It was much more into metal. Yeah, the the like at the end of the '80s, like punk rock got really bad to me. There was like all these youth crew bands or like really derivative, crappy, like fourth-rate hardcore when they were all straight edge, and then uh, or all the bands I like broke up, and uh, so I got into like I got really into the grunge stuff, like all the sub pop stuff. I was I was in that singles club, like I bought it all, and all the like the noise rock, like stuff on amphetamine reptile records. I got way into that. I also really got into industrial music, you know, because the gateway drug for that was Skinny Puppy, um, and that's still my favorite band ever. But that turned me on to the whole this whole new music scene, which was exciting to me as punk rock and thrash metal was in the eighty in the early eighties, at the end of the eighties and the early nineties. This industrial stuff, like the whole wax track scene, was fantastic. <laughs> What? Well, Chicago. Al Jorgensen's yeah, yeah. I mean, from, was, from yeah, Chicago, isn't he? the home base of yeah. industrial music, you know, like the, the epicenter of that. And uh, that was huge. I was huge into that until about the mid-'90s when, again, that kind of got stale. I have a controversial ministry opinion. You have what? I have a controversial ministry opinion. With, with Sympathy is your I favorite I love the With Sympathy record. That's a really good record. Don't you agree? It's fan- I mean, it's not my favorite, but it's a great record. Okay. I do yeah. like the industrial stuff, but I really do like that. Yeah, I yeah. interned at RCA Nashville when I was in college. And uh, they had this massive catalog, and as an employee, you could pick five records per month and get them for free. So I, I saw, oh, Ministry, it was the only record on RCA with, with Sympathy. I wonder what that is. And I got it. I was like, this is a great new wave record, man. It really is. Like, I yeah. still listen to that record. It's good. It's just like a different band. It really oh, is. totally. Yeah. He was very much a chameleon. Like, he kind of, like, you know, changed to what he thought was cool at the time like he was doing the synth pop like he denies it now but he was way into that stuff back then like I know people that are friends with him and then he got turned on to the more heavier industrial music and then he and then he got really into metal which he mixed with the industrial I mean I admire the career path it's super unique but uh but you know he's also got some revisionist history of like oh the label made me do that that's that's crap like he willingly and happily did that because that's what he was into at the time well i mean everybody knows who ricky gervais is right have you heard his seen his video oh yes it's the same thing right it's actually pretty good though yeah it's it's it's, it's good new wave music yeah i mean there's nothing people's tastes change over time there's nothing wrong nothing wrong with that you were into that and now you evolve a lot of bands do that i admire it you know 
Yeah, you guys have any questions? Yeah, let's like, do we've that. We've been blabbing on about Kiss for like two and a half days, <laughs> but you guys can ask. Does, the way. does anyone do have a like, story or a question? Set us or? down a different path of talking about different bands. What's your opinion on Fin Troll? On uh, what? Fin Troll. I don't even know what that is. Yeah. Oh, you never touched into folk metal? No. No. Does Gogol Bordello count as anywhere near that ballpark? Because I like them, but I don't own the records. But I've shot them like four times. Is that like Days of the New? Um, if I was, of anything you might like compare it to, I would almost say uh, Metalocalypse, uh, the, oh, so. uh, especially their troll song. <laughs> it's like that straight riff from the uh, Fin Troll. Oh. Like it's a, it's a basically a spoof of Fin Troll that episode. I don't know if this is anywhere in the same ballpark. Do you know that band, The Who? Not the old rock band, The H.U. The H.U. They're like this weird, like tribal kind of thing. I shot them once right before, like the year, the Halloween before COVID happened, and uh, they were really, really good and very unique, but very like, kind of like, tribal sounding and almost folk in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. crazy videos, and it's almost like uh... they're Mongolian. Yes, yes, yeah. They were they're really good. And it's like um, yeah, like tribal like. Uh... Yeah, yeah. They were really, really good. I never heard them. Almost before. like hakas or something like. Yeah. That. yeah. I was shooting shows at the House of Vans regularly, and they they did a show there. And so I'm like, I'll shoot this. It looks interesting, you know, and it was great. Any other questions or musical suggestions or anybody want any nerdy punk rock record trivia? Uh, <laughs> when you said you saw a Black Black reunion yeah. early off, was that, was that when they had a pre-recorded bass track that they were so, Oh, so I'm glad you asked that. That's a good – yes and no. So I – it's both answers because they had some crappy opening bands I don't even remember. And then they did the whole My War album with Mike Vallely singing. Um, and the bass was all pre-recorded. So it was Greg, it was Mike singing, and I don't remember who they got to play drums. And then... I heard it was Robo that they got Robo. It was not. Robo couldn't get back in the country or something like that. It was supposed to be, and he didn't show. And, uh, and then when they did the whole My War album, poorly, I might add... Um, then the, you know, then the main event was uh, was with Des singing. So it was Greg playing guitar, Des singing. I don't remember who the bass player and the drummer were, but I think it would end up being the two guys that were playing in Gone at the time, which was Greg's you know solo band. I think I don't remember. I was really drunk at this point at the night, and it was 2003. So right, I just remember the, there's a it's like legendarily bad because there was a. A pre-recorded bass that they were trying to hold. Right, play. and they build it as like Dale Nixon as the bass player, which was Greg's one of Greg's fake names because he played bass on My War and guitar, so he called himself Dale Nixon. So they said Dale. So Greg pre-recorded the bass tracks on a tape that they that they played along to at that show. It was all, it was it was as it was worse than I'm describing it. Like I'm being a little generous, you know. I mean, it's legendary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, they played the Palladium. I mean, that, pl that place holds thousands of people, and they packed it. I think it sold out. I mean, I literally know from people from all around the U.S. that I was friends with. Flew, we all flew out for that thing. Yeah. I think yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> could that be why White Zombie sounded better later? That could be. <laughs> could be, yeah. Because yeah, they, they lowered the bar. Yeah. You know? Yes, sir. You mentioned your first concert. What, what was your best concert? Skinny Puppy in 1988, which was – so I'll try to keep – this story is super long, and I'm not going to give you that one because you guys will all walk out of here. But the short of it was I just started seeing this girl. I'm, like, 19 years old, and I really liked her. And she asked me if I wanted to go and drive her and her two friends because they didn't have – they were – she was two years younger than me, so she was, like, 17 – and at first, I'm like, nah, I'm not into them. Like, I don't really know what they sound like. And then I got off the phone with her, and I immediately thought, like, this little voice on my shoulder. I was like, why wouldn't you just say yes so you could spend time with the girl? So I called her back. I'm like, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. I'll go. So they bought me this ticket, and I saw the show, this band. I'd only heard the name of it. I didn't know what they sounded like. The greatest show I've ever seen to this day. Like, nothing will top it. And they've been my favorite band since that day. And uh, the girl's long gone. You know, that only lasted five years. But the band, like, I'll... They'll be my favorite band, like long when I long after I leave this planet, you know. And I've also the the band I've seen most. I've seen them twenty one times. Boy, you know, you think I'd say a metal band, and I've seen a lot of really great metal bands from 
you know, Megadeth, the Slayer, and stuff like that. But the one band that blew me away at the time, we uh, saw Radiohead, and they were doing the OK Computer tour. It was in Seattle, and that album was brand new, and they blew our minds. I mean, it was just such a. It was one of those moments where you where you're at a show and you're like, oh, they're going to be huge. Like, you know, we were into the album, but it's like this band is going places. It was. It was amazing to be at a show where everyone was leaning forward to like really get into you know the band and it was just their moment in time and I, I feel like it was very lucky to be there at that moment. Um, it was just such a killer show. So anybody else? You talked on a lot of nostalgic heartstrings coming from the eighties and seventies, and for me. Um, that is kind of kiboshed by like gatekeeping in the early 90s from different genres. And it wasn't until the 2000s, we worked with a client in Tokyo, he introduced me to some local band, um, Tokyo to that show. It's kind of like reinvigorating my love for music. I've always wondered, and I've had these discussions before with other individuals, it seems like the market in the US for bands is now geared towards pop. Rock is dead. Um, metal was fragmented, but if you go into Europe, you go into Asia, they're, they're killing it with albums, they're killing it with the crowd interaction. But we don't quite see that here in the States. Um, have you noticed that at all? Or is there anything that you can speak to that maybe would pull the, the States back into more of the uh, music genre? So in, in Seattle, we are very lucky. We have one of the last major radio stations that's programmed by real DJs. Uh, nothing comes from, you know, somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, it's called KXP.org, uh, and uh, it's completely listener-driven, and it is one of those oases where, uh, you know, I, in full disclosure, I have a friend of mine who's a DJ there, and you can text him, and he will play it. And it'll it, they'll play everything from metal to alternative to country to whatever, and it's awesome, but it's also incredibly unusual. And they have to do a fundraiser every single year to keep it running. Because, you know, it's just the, the way of the world, and or the way of the, you know, you know, the U.S., unfortunately. And I think that's not really anywhere else. I, is, are you I've, aware of anybody else that has I, that? No, I've done my best in the last 40 years to avoid any mainstream music, especially now. It's mm. so terrible, but... Um, in Chicago, we're spoiled, though, like on a smaller scale. We have one of the most thriving live music cities probably in the entire United States. Like on any given night, you could go to a half dozen venues and check out rock music, metal music, all the stuff that you mentioned. Uh, you know, they're playing anywhere from 50 to 1,000 or 1,500, 2,000 people on the bigger scale of that, right? But, um, for example, I saw a Dinosaur Jr. play at a 1,400-seat club, you know, and they packed it sold it out but or, or you could go to a place called Reggie's that does shows almost every night they've got punk bands they got metal bands they got rock bands you know that place holds 300 or so people but we got so many clubs like you could go see live music at two two times a night and pretty much every night in Chicago if but a lot of it's stuff you know newer bands local bands small touring bands they you know but if you're just a, if you're just adventurous you could go out every night and see great live bands but there's not a big, we don't have a lot, a big vehicle. We've got some college radio stations that if you live in the city, you can pick up. But it's not like we have a, we don't have like they do have in Seattle. Like we don't have a cool radio station like that that would turn you onto it. It's kind of like all word of mouth where if you hang out at these certain rock clubs, like you just like to go to shows there. Some people will just go to them just because they like the club. They're like, I'll go pick this random show, pay 10 box to get in and see you know a bunch of bands and oh, hope for a good one oh to be to be fair though i mean streaming has been kind of the great equalizer right is that you know the the recommended next song can be anything from anywhere in the world which is pretty cool oh, the yeah. yeah absolutely and so that you know and i i i pay attention to that you know i mean i'll give some a, a, a song a listen even if i'm not familiar with the band to see if i like it or not also too you know the internet with like facebook groups and things like that i'll be a part of where you know i every friday i'll i'll pay attention to what albums are coming out that's how i knew that there was a new queensrike album because it was on pauseandplay.com because they list every new album that comes out or sleazerocks.com you know that talks about all the new rock albums that come out or 
blabbermouth or something like that. So it's out there, but, but it, it, it's you have to you have to be aggressive in trying to find it as opposed to just flipping on a, a radio and sort of having it introduced to you, you, got, you like gotta it be, used to be. You got to be proactive instead of passive. Yeah, yeah. Here's an interesting trivia for you guys. I'm such a purist, like, I only listen to vinyl records in my house. I don't even play CDs anymore. The CDs are the vehicle to put the music on my phone, and I won't use a streaming service, and I'll never pay for one. I, I put all the MP3s on my phone for when I exercise, when I travel. But if I'm at home, if it's not on a vinyl record, like, it's not getting played in my house. And I would never use streaming services. So when people send me, like, hey, go check this out, I'm like, well, send me the record because, like, I'm not going to go listen to it. Any other way. That's why my girlfriend bought me that Idols record. She knew I wasn't going to ever, tur- like, install Spotify and listen to that. Like, And she figured I would just go buy the record, so she beat me to it and tried to do and did something really sweet. But, yeah, I know I'm, like, very much a minority for that, but that's just that's just how I operate. Like, I don't even have a CD player hooked up in the house anymore. Like, it's just vinyl records at home. I mean, I, I would argue, though, that it used to be that I, I was the same way, although now you can get lossless audio through, like, Apple Music. Oh, yeah. And with, with spatial, like... The, the way that they master it yeah. sounds incredible. I mean, it's it's truly lossless. It sounds very good. And I've A-B'd them in my car. In my car, I have a very nice stereo. Yeah. And um, th- I've got a couple albums where I put them on. I'm like, oh, you know, when you hear something that you've never heard before in your favorite album. Yeah. And so I would say, I, I get it. You don't own the music. But it is a great venue. It, it's very conven- convenient. And it is a great venue for discovering new stuff. Yeah. You know? When I was visiting my friend in Seattle, the, my friend Vince I talked about earlier, he was play, you know, he was driving me around when we were going to all these record stores. He was playing me all kinds of stuff. He turned me on to like three or four bands that I bought records from on that trip. Yeah. Because, and, you know, I'm not, like, if I was in your car, I'd be like, yeah, play me everything you want off the streaming thing. Right. I just don't want to invest time and money into it for per, my, for myself. And, but and if to, I'm around it, I'll be, I'll, oh, it's certainly a good way to for And to be clear, I mean, me. I use it in, in, uh, to, to figure out, okay, what do I want to buy? Because I do like you, I like vinyl. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't really consider that I own anything until I've actually bought the vinyl. Right. You know, or a CD if that's what you're into. But uh, and, and so, but also too, I mean, vinyl is expensive. Like God, if you yeah, notice, like it's hurt, brand it's new painfully vinyl, expensive. Thirty five, forty dollars. Yeah, I mean, I, I used mean, to buy those things. You know, brand new, eight dollars was the expensive albums, and yeah. seven was the standard. Yeah. So and I have to really love it now. Yeah, but I mean, I've spent hundreds of dollars on single records because I'm a crazy record this collector. This weekend. Oh, yeah, then that was not on a single record. But I mean, oh, I have. Yeah. Like, the most I ever spent for a single record was 550 bucks. What record was that? It was the first Misfits 7 uh, I knew you were going to cool. say that. I knew and and I bought it. When I bought it, it was going for a grand, and I bought it from a friend of mine who was getting married. And he, he's like, I know I could get 1000 bucks for this, but you've always wanted it, and it, I'll feel good that you, about you because I know you'll have it forever. So he goes, I'll sell it to you for what I paid for it, which... And I just lost my job like three days before. I'm like, screw it. I'm like, I'm never gonna get to own this record any other way. I'll just not eat, you know. So, and and it was the best decision I ever made. There is that collector's mantra: the time to buy it is when you see it. Exactly. Like it may not come back. I can't tell you. I mean, I have. We could spend another hour of me just giving the regrets of the records I didn't buy, and then now I can't afford. I'll never afford. You know, like okay, I could sell a pinball machine and buy this record but like i can't do that like i i would spend that money on fixing up my house or something you know yeah or buying more shelves to hold records in my house i think we have time for one more question and someone over here yes um your two desert island records two, the two albums you have to have if you're stranded on desert island the first one that came to mind is an album that i can it's so dense and i can always go back to it and i love it it's a dream theater scenes from a memory it's it's a you know prog rock masterpiece. It's so dense, um, mo- many 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 styles in there. That's definitely number one. And you know he mentioned the Beatles, and it, it I could very easily pick a Beatles album too. You know, um, just because they never get old. You know what I mean? It's a it it's funny because the other day I was putting on a Beatles album, and it's like yeah, it's okay. It sounds maybe a little dated, but the songs are timeless. You know, so Sgt. Pepper's or really anything. I don't, I mean, even Let It Be. I mean, whatever. It's like, you know. New Revolver. New Revolver. Really good. Really good. They just released really a new box set for that. Yeah, I'm waiting. I pre-ordered that thing. I mean, and hopefully like it arrives by the time I get home. Something. Yeah. And, and that's a good, good example of the, the remasters are, are, like, really amazing. Like, you, you hear something new that you've never heard before on those albums. It's really incredible. So, those I'd, would be my two. I'd be high-picked to press the pick two. But if I if you if you force me to, 
One of them would be the Tear Garden album called Tired Eyes Slowly Burning. That was a side project of Skinny Puppy along with the singer of the legendary Pink Dots. My favorite song in the world is a song called You and Me and Rainbows by the Tear Garden. So that get wins by default. And probably Skinny Puppy's Vivisex 6 album because that was the album they toured on when I saw them that first time, the best show I ever saw. And it, it's my favorite album of theirs and it was my first one I ever got. But honestly, that that those answers could change on any given day, but those will probably be my default, you know. And, and you have to, they, they got to be the Kiss albums, so come on. Uh, actually, they're not. My favorite year in music is 1981. I think there were zillions of great records that were. That's a that's an exaggeration. Uh, a lot of good records that came out in 1981. So two of my Desert Island discs would be uh, Moving Pictures by Rush, and Ghost in the Machine by The Police. Two great albums. All right, a uh, few vinyl guys, if you don't know about this, three years ago, I discovered a podcast called The Vinyl Guide. Oh, that's oh, fantastic. It is I love the that. best yeah. thing ever. I interview some great guests. It's a U.S. expat that uh, moved to Australia 20 or so years ago and has probably as many records as Mike. <laughs> so, And he yeah. is super nerd. He is, he yeah. He some amazing people. He does. I'll give you a very similar one, uh, but it's... There's one called Turned Out of Punk. Uh, this dude, can I swear? Because the name of this guy's band, I'll, I'll abbreviate it for radio. The singer of the band effed up. Um, he, his name is uh, uh, Damien, Damien Abrahams, I think is his name. Anyway, he does a podcast called Turned Out of Punk, and he interviews punk, like old punk, like mostly musicians, sometimes like professional wrestlers. And they're mostly musicians that somehow were involved or still might be in punk rock. And he starts it off by asking how they got involved in it. But he's a fantastic interviewer and he's had some really great like big names. You know, he's had like, you know, people from Axe. He had uh he had Alice Bag on there. He had uh Keith Morris, you know, he just did uh God, there's a bunch. I listen to it all the time. He had Tom Hazelmeyer from Amphetamine Reptile Records, he used to be in Halo Flies. He had uh Stephen McDonald from Red Cross. Um he had one of the dudes from Guns N' Roses and a whole bunch of others and some rock ones too, um, but mostly punk. And it just, it's just fantastic. Like, uh, I highly recommend that one. But that Vinyl Guy, that's one of my favorite podcasts. Oh, yeah. So good. Uh, Mike Vinacore, Metal Jesus, thank you for your time. Thank you. Audience, thank you, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you all for coming. This was fun. Rock on. No, normally, I'm up here talking about what we do at Stern and talking about pinball for an hour. So it was when... when uh, when they asked me to come do this podcast because I'm so into music, I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a good time. Count me in. So thank, thank you guys, guys for coming. Thank you.